I'm Jeff Lewis and I'm the pilot on the MiG-15. The Aviator's staff correspondent, Jeff Lewis, codenamed Biscuit, has a passion for aviation. Normally on The Aviators, Jeff is a field correspondent, but on today's show, he is the subject of a segment. We caught up with him just before one of his air show performances in the legendary MiG-15. Well, I've been flying for a long time. Uh, my background is I'm a professional pilot, captain with Air Canada. Um, to fly an aircraft like this, you do require a couple thousand hours and uh, some jet experience, either uh, professionally or on corporate jets uh, is a good background for it, and as well as uh, flying other aircraft like our L-29 Delph, and that sets you up uh, with the skill set required to fly this type of high-performance uh, swept-wing jet. This is a neat airplane. Uh, the MiG-15 was the most widely produced jet aircraft in history. Over 18,000 examples that were built, uh, mostly by the Russians, but also under license by the uh, Polish, the Czech, and the Chinese. Uh, this particular MiG-15 is uh, manufactured in 1954 in Russia, and the aircraft was operated by the Soviet Air Force from 1954 to 1968. After flying the L-29, we started thinking, oh, that'd be kind of a neat airplane. I think uh, a lot of people were asking us, so is that a MiG, is that a MiG? And we didn't have a MiG at that time, so we started looking around, and uh, this aircraft caught our attention. And once we saw it, and obviously then had the opportunity to fly it, we had to, we had to have one. So. Back when the aircraft was in service, the uh, instructor sat in the back. So actually, if you're sitting in the back and you know what you're doing, you can override all the instrumentation in the front and give uh, the guy a run for his money who's flying the aircraft. But um, overall, you know, the airplane, if you respect it, it's, uh, it's a beautiful aircraft to fly. It's very responsive, but it will bite you. And unless you know what you're doing, uh, you can end up in some trouble. But, you know, hey, 1947 technology, uh, what do you expect for a first time? Yeah, the, the MiG-15 was uh, the most widely produced uh, jet aircraft in history. Uh, 18,000 examples were produced. However, there's not very many of them flying anymore. Um, I would hazard a guess uh, that there's probably in the range of 20 aircraft actually flying and in active flying condition today. As a two-seater, I would say that's less than a dozen. This is a rare aircraft with the second seat. She's a thirsty bird. Uh, the MiG-15, uh, you're looking at 460 gallons an hour. The aircraft holds 462 gallons in one hour. That's it. And during an air show routine, you know, we go through 500 liters pretty quickly and that's in a 10 minute 12 minute routine, uh, she drinks the gas. Even at ground idle, we are uh, in the 100 gallon an hour type range. So it's a thirsty bird and my carbon footprint's larger than Texas, but you know what? It's a lot of fun. Um, it was always said that the aircraft was not recoverable in a spin. I've, I'm standing here, but I haven't spun it, so <laughs> I don't want to try. Flat spins are considered unrecoverable. Aerobatic pilot Neil Spooner entered a flat spin, which is usually fatal. It was caught in dramatic detail with an onboard camera. He was one of the lucky pilots who lived to tell about it. But was it luck or skill? To find out, the Aviator's UK correspondent caught up with him at his own airfield. Neil's kindly joined us by his aircraft. So Neil, what, what first got you into flying? Uh, it was my wife's fault. She bought me a trial lesson in 1988 and um, it all went steadily downhill from there um, with my private pilot's licence and um, I always wanted to go commercial, which I eventually did. Why the nipper? Um, I saw Barry Smith campaign a, um, a tipsy nipper many, many years ago. It must have been about 1986 and I have to say he put on a very, very good show with it. And I thought, well, if you can do that with um, sort of 1800 cc's of Volkswagen and burning three gallons of petrol an hour, um, then really it's a very, very affordable way um, of doing aerobatics. And for my level of aerobatics, it really does everything. I put inverted fuel systems, oil systems, so I can leave it upside down all day for as long as I feel happy on the strap. You uploaded a video to YouTube of you and your aircraft doing 26 flat spins. Can, can you talk us through? What happened? Yeah, um, I have to say it, it caught me very much by surprise. Uh, I always thought that the flat spin was the province of um, more thoroughbred aircraft than the tipsy nipper. It's a very good forum, particularly in the aviation world, to offer um, insight into what can happen. Can you take us through the video itself, please, now? Of course. Um, watching the video, I have to say, uh, I still have a little bit of trouble with, but um, initially a clearing turn. This is a bit that I always hate, where throttle back and start to pitch up into the stall. 
The mistake I made was using full aileron to help initiate the stall from a fully stalled condition with um, quite an aggressive rudder input. I knew the spin had gone flat very, very quickly. Within half a turn I thought this doesn't look right. The nose attitude isn't as low as it should be and um, the rate of rotation is, is different and um, applied normal spin recovery technique made absolutely no difference. The tail group felt like they were actually disconnected from the controls. There's absolutely no aerodynamic loading at all. Absolutely no effect. I got some control loading on the ailerons themselves and that was the only control surface I could got any feedback on. So I thought that would probably be the key to getting me out and um, by using in-turn aileron, this is a spin to the right, in-turn aileron, what you're effectively doing is the down-going aileron produces some drag which helps oppose the yaw of the aircraft and um, that helped along with forward stick help the nose go down, the aircraft to roll into a normal elect, um, erect spin from which it was simplicity itself to, uh, to recover from, it's just instinct. How, well, how did he feel? At that stage, incredibly disorientated. You cannot imagine just how disorientated. I couldn't read the instruments. Initially, just staying straight and level for a number of seconds um, was all I could really do. Once I'd um, got control of the aircraft back and um, a few of my sensors back, scanned for somewhere to land out and uh, turned into wind uh, and spotted the area to land. The fact that somebody had erected a, a barbed wire fence that was invisible to me was, uh, was the fly in the ointment. What did you learn from the experience? Um, proper uh, spin entry is, is one thing. Um, it was a mishandled spin entry by using um, full aileron to, uh, to initiate the, uh, the spin, which in this case I didn't need to do because it's from a fully stored state. What would be the one piece of advice you would give someone? Um, be very aware of the fact that their aircraft will not always do what they anticipate. On this occasion, because I was entering the spin from a slightly different uh, control input set, I added 500 feet, which I always do to anything new um, when I'm practicing. That 500 foot saved my life um, because I can only estimate, because I couldn't read the instruments, I came out of the um, manoeuvre at around about five to 700. Uh, and essentially, good training. Good training, I think, is the way to go. Uh, if you are going to aerobat an aircraft, you need to know about these corners of the flight envelope, which uh, really, um, you never know when you're going to, uh, to enter. The Aviators, for everyone who has ever gazed skywards. For more information on today's segments, visit www.theaviators.tv.